Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Royalty Now, where we bring you face to face with figures from the past. Alexander Hamilton is one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. His brilliance, idealism, and pride made him a favorite of George Washington and a bitter rival to Thomas Jefferson. Today, we'll talk about his history and then reveal the face of one of our founding fathers. So let's go ahead and get started. Alexander Hamilton was born on the Caribbean island of Nevis on January 11th in either 1755 or 1757. His mother, Rachel Fawcett, was half British and half French Huguenot and had lived in the Caribbean her entire life. Rachel was married to a man named Johann Levine until she left the unhappy situation in 1750. Not long after, she would meet James Hamilton. The fourth son of a Scottish lord, he had nothing to inherit, so he had become a drifting traitor, which brought him to the Caribbean. Within weeks, the two would fall in love. But due to Rachel's previous marriage, they were unable to marry themselves. The two would still move in together in Nevis and have two children, James Jr. and Alexander Hamilton. Very little is known about Alexander's youth. We know that he lived in a house by the sea that his mother had inherited from her father. And because his parents weren't married, he was looked down upon. We know that he wasn't allowed to go to church or school and was mostly educated by his mother and himself with the family's collection of books. And finally, we know that in 1765, when Alexander was maybe 10 years old, his father James left the family. Historians now believe that this wasn't an act of abandonment by Hamilton's father, but actually one of protection. Rachel was still married to another man, and while her husband was still alive, she could face criminal charges if found to be living with James. At 11 years old, Alexander began working in order to help his family survive. He probably lied about his age and got a job working as a clerk in a counting house it's here that we begin to see the man that Hamilton would become. His manners, intelligence, and ability impress his bosses and colleagues, and he begins to climb the ladder, getting promoted to bookkeeper and then manager. With his new income and his mother managing a small store, the family is able to get themselves out of poverty, and things are beginning to look up. But suddenly, in 1768, Rachel began to feel sick. On February 19th, Alexander's mother died, shocking and devastating young Alexander and his brother. In a true act of cruelty, Rachel's ex-husband Johann seized her estate and the few valuables she owned, leaving Alexander and his brother homeless. Left with nothing but the clothes on their backs and a few books that Alexander was able to keep, the boys would now have to find their own way in the world. James Jr. managed to find a place to stay by becoming an apprentice to a carpenter, and Alexander was given a home by a man named Thomas Stevens, a merchant who traded between New York and the Caribbean. Although he was young, Alexander's life had given him a maturity that impressed those around him, and by 1771, when he was maybe 16, he was already trusted enough to be in charge of an entire trading firm. But he never gave up on his education, in his free time, he had become an avid reader and was just beginning to write things of his own. When a hurricane hit nearby Christiansted, Alexander wrote a letter to his father with an account of the hurricane. What horror and destruction. It's impossible for me to describe or you to form any idea of it. It seemed as if a total dissolution of nature was taking place. The roaring of the sea and wind fiery meteors flying about it in the air, the prodigious glare of almost perpetual lightning, the crash of the falling houses, and the ear-piercing shrieks of the distressed were sufficient to strike astonishment into angels. This dramatic retelling impressed Alexander's father, and when his father showed others the letter, they were shocked to hear that Alexander was self-taught. So impressed with his eloquence, they submitted it to a newspaper, and it was published. That one simple letter had just changed his life forever. Soon donations were coming in to help Alexander go to North America to get an education. 
So Alexander Hamilton left the Caribbean and set out to make a name for himself. Landing in Boston in October of 1772, he would make his way up to New York City. This portrait we've been using was drawn from life of Hamilton in 1773, and you can see just how young he looks. He was either 16 or 18 in this portrait. In the fall of 1773, Hamilton entered King's College, what is now Columbia University, and took the opportunity to go to school incredibly seriously. But the world around him was changing, and Hamilton was taking notice. That December, the Boston Tea Party incident ignited political debates, and discussions that Alexander found he had a passion for. He began to defend the Boston Tea Party and its cause, first to his roommates and then publicly in speeches to his classmates, along with what is thought to be about 20 published writings. In 1775, the American Revolutionary War began, and King's College was soon closed down. If he wasn't going to be able to make a name for himself academically, he would do it through glory on the battlefield. Alexander joined the New York Volunteer Militia and began fighting almost immediately. In one of his very first missions, his unit would successfully capture British cannons in Manhattan. The unit would keep those cannons and become an artillery unit from then on. It wasn't long before he was promoted to captain, with his company being involved in many battles, including the Battle of Harlem Heights, the Battle of Trenton, and specifically the Battle of Princeton, where Hamilton's artillery company caused the surrender of nearly 200 British soldiers, ending the battle. Not long into his service, Alexander's attention to detail and intelligence had been noticed by many of the generals in the Continental Army, with nearly all of them inviting Hamilton to become their personal aide. But Hamilton knew that the only way to make a name for himself would be through glory on the battlefield, so he continued as an officer. That was until, in February of 1777, Hamilton was requested once more to become a personal aide. But this time, the request was from George Washington. He accepted the offer immediately. Over the next few years, Alexander would travel with Washington everywhere he went. Washington trusted him with important documents and diplomatic missions. Hamilton had also learned how to speak French fluently, so he became a liaison with high-ranking French generals, like Marquis de Lafayette. Hamilton and Lafayette would become very close friends and remain so for the rest of their lives. Hamilton found himself rubbing shoulders with some of the most important men in the war. And in early 1780, he would meet Elizabeth Schuyler, the daughter of General Philip Schuyler, one of the wealthiest men in New York. Within only a month, Alexander and Elizabeth, whom he called Eliza, married at the Schuyler Mansion in New York. Throughout their lives, the union would be tumultuous, but also fiercely loyal. They would go on to have eight children together. After serving with Washington for three years, he was desperate to go back to active duty, but Washington refused. In early 1781, Hamilton was reprimanded by Washington after just a minor misunderstanding. The frustrated Hamilton insisted that Washington was better off without him, and he resigned. But luckily, a few months later, Washington extended an olive branch by finally giving Alexander Hamilton command of a battalion at the Siege of Yorktown, which was the last major land battle in the American Revolution, Hamilton led his men to glory, commanding 400 men to take the final British fortification, all but guaranteeing an American victory. Hamilton's command and victory that day was crucial to Washington's plans, and Washington never faltered in his belief in Hamilton again. The Revolutionary War was finally over. Coming back to civilian life after seven years of war was hard for many of the men who fought, but not for Alexander Hamilton. Within six months of returning, he had passed the bar and was also appointed to the Congress of the Confederation as the representative of New York State. The war had permanently shaped Alexander's political views. He had seen firsthand that Congress's inability to tax the states 
had led to Washington's army running out of provisions and funds. It had left American forces dependent on loans from France and other countries, and soldiers had gone nearly a year without being paid. Taxes were the only way to raise those funds, but all the states needed to approve the tax raise, which they would never accept. As the soldiers became more and more irate, Hamilton became increasingly frustrated with the weakness of the central government. He began to form ideas, revisions to the Articles of Confederation. These changes were things we are now very familiar with. The ability for government to collect taxes and raise an army, and also the separation of powers between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. But he would have to wait a while before he could bring these ideas to light. In the coming years, Hamilton would resign from Congress, moving back to New York to spend time with Eliza, and even founding the Bank of New York. He would continue arguing for stronger national government, but he was always left in the minority. It would take four more years for people to realize that the Articles of Confederation were failing the Republic. Rebellions were occurring all over. There was Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts, and Georgia was even being attacked by the British. But Congress could do nothing to help those states. The vision of a respectable nation seemed to be fading, and George Washington's dream of a republic, of the people and for the people, was in serious doubt. In early 1787, the Congress finally called a convention to propose revisions to the Articles in hopes of saving the nation. Finally, Hamilton could bring his ideas to light, what he thought their new nation should look like. But while some of his ideas were well received, some were seen as radical and even monarchist by his fellow delegates. At one point, he proposed that the president should be elected for life, with the contingency of good behavior, of course. But this hit too close to home for men like James Madison, who reminded the convention of the horrors of absolute rule in England that they had just recently escaped. And Madison's arguments turned fellow delegates against Hamilton. After four hard months of debate, the convention was able to draft an early version of what would later become the United States Constitution. And although not all of his ideas were accepted, some were, and Hamilton signed off on the document. But the Constitution had not yet been ratified, meaning it would only take effect once it had been agreed upon by at least nine of the 13 states. This challenge would lead Hamilton to work on something he's now famous for, the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers are a huge collection of essays promoting the ratification of the Constitution that were published in New York in 1787 and 1788. These essays, written mostly by Hamilton, but with the help of James Madison and John Jay, explain the new constitutional powers and the powers of the executive, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. The papers were widely read and they helped many people make an informed decision on whether or not to support this new framework. In June of 1788, the Constitution would finally be ratified. But it came at a cost. In the final moments, the southern states were able to negotiate protections for slave labor and the slave trade. Hamilton himself never owned a slave and even founded the New York Manumission Society, which promoted abolition. But Hamilton was, once again, in the minority on the issue. The issue of slavery would continue to rip the country apart for the next 60 years. In 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected as the first president of the United States. He chose his old colleague and friend, Alexander Hamilton, as the first secretary of the treasury. Over the following years, Hamilton would broker a solution to the massive problem of debt in the young nation. He arranged for the central government to assume all of the state's debts and created the first national bank of the United States. This succeeded in convincing Europe that the United States was financially sound. But it angered many of Hamilton's contemporaries, and two political factions had begun to form, the first political parties in the United States. The Federalists, including George Washington and John Adams, supported Hamilton. They believed in a strong central government supported by a national army. And the Democratic Republicans included Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who favored strong state governments based in rural America 
and supported by state militias. Hamilton's reasoning behind these political views is that he wanted Americans to see themselves first as citizens of the United States, not just citizens of the states they lived in. The two parties would debate over all types of issues, and this would begin a bitter rivalry between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. But Hamilton seemed to be on the wrong side of one very important issue. He believed that strong ties to England would keep the United States financially sound, while the Democratic Republicans believed that France, who had just helped them win the war, were their true allies. France was now in its own fight for equality. But Hamilton detested the French Revolution and persuaded Washington not to aid them. Alexander's political rivals began to call him a monarchist, a loyalist, and even people from his own party, like John Adams, began to resent Hamilton's influence on Washington. In 1796, Alexander Hamilton was expecting the Federalist Party's nomination for president. But it never came. Instead, they had chosen the less controversial candidate, John Adams. Hamilton lashed out, writing a statement saying that Adams was too emotionally unstable to be president. And Adams would reply, stating that Hamilton was overambitious and scandalous in his private life, hinting at something that wasn't yet public knowledge. Adams would go on to win the 1796 presidential election, but the animosity between the two men had split the Federalist Party in two. Hamilton was holding out hope that he would be able to gain back his influence before the 1800 election year. However, something from his past would come out that would derail Hamilton's political career forever. Back in the summer of 1791, five years before, Alexander Hamilton was caught up in what is now referred to as America's first sex scandal. You see, he had been having a months-long affair with a 23-year-old woman named Maria Reynolds. But what he didn't realize was that her husband James was aware of their relationship. It wasn't long before Hamilton was being blackmailed. He would end up paying James the equivalent of $40,000 today. And the extortion didn't end there. James was eventually jailed for financial crimes and used the secret to pressure Hamilton into helping him escape. Soon, word had spread to James Monroe that Hamilton had helped a man escape prison. Monroe confronted Hamilton, accusing him of being involved in the same financial scheme as James Reynolds, and his story quickly unraveled. Eventually, Alexander had admitted the whole thing. Luckily, Monroe insisted that the matter was settled and everything was quiet for a few years. However, when Hamilton left his position as Secretary of the Treasury, Thomas Jefferson took the opportunity to spread rumors of his corruption. Hamilton knew that the leak had to have come from James Monroe, and after a fiery confrontation, Monroe challenged Hamilton to a duel. But thanks to a man named Aaron Burr, who convinced Monroe not to go through with it, the duel was avoided. But Hamilton still had to deal with the fallout. On August 25th, 1797, he released a response to the allegations, refuting all charges of corruption, but admitting his relationship with Maria Reynolds. His honesty was appreciated by some, like George Washington, who still valued him as one of his most trusted advisors. But it had ruined his reputation and made him an easy target for his rivals, like Thomas Jefferson and now John Adams. Hamilton clearly felt burdened by the years of controversy, scandals, and rivalries, and he began to make emotional decisions, no longer caring about party lines. The presidential election of 1800 was looming, and in a surprise move, Hamilton began to work against his own party, attacking John Adams again. Adams ended up losing the election, which left Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson tied in the Electoral College. In a twist of fate, it was Hamilton that was left with the tie-breaking vote. He could single-handedly prevent his bitter rival, Thomas Jefferson, from becoming president. Everyone, including Aaron Burr, expected Hamilton to vote accordingly. Hamilton instead chose Thomas Jefferson, stating that he was the lesser of the two evils and that Burr was a mischievous, dangerous enemy. 
Burr was infuriated, and he would never forget Hamilton's disrespect. Their rivalry would continue for years, and any chance Hamilton got, he would speak ill of Burr. When Burr lost the 1804 election for New York governor, he blamed Hamilton for his losses. He would send Hamilton a letter demanding that he apologize for all of the ill he had spoken of him over the years. Alexander replied, refusing to apologize, saying he couldn't remember any specific insult he had said to Burr, which obviously angered Burr even more. After a series of letters attempting to reconcile, Aaron Burr challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel. On the dawn of July 11th, 1804, Burr and Hamilton met along the west bank of the Hudson River. Hamilton and Burr took their steps, turned, and both raised their pistols. Both stood there, staring across at each other for a full minute. Then suddenly, two shots, one after the other, rang out. A branch broke only inches above Aaron Burr's head, and Alexander Hamilton fell to the ground. He was shot in the stomach. Immediately, Hamilton was taken to a surgeon at a nearby boarding house, but there was nothing that could be done. On July 12, 1804, Alexander Hamilton died at the age of 49, surrounded by more than 20 friends and loved ones. Alexander Hamilton was a man of many faces. He was brilliant and logical, yet emotional and brash. But it was this perfect combination that allowed him to rise from his humble beginnings to become one of the most important men in our nation's history. And although his life was cut short, today he is considered by all as a founding father of the United States of America. So what did Alexander Hamilton really look like? There are dozens of depictions of Hamilton that exist for us today. In fact, he's one of the most represented American figures in monuments across the US. But not everyone agrees on which ones look the most like the real man. It's the same issue I had with my George Washington recreations. Many portraits were made after Hamilton's death and probably aren't very close to what he really looked like. Let's start with what we do know, based on the description of a close personal friend, William Sullivan. Hamilton was short, around 5'7 and thin, but he had a really strong and dignified presence that made him seem larger than life. While normally looking a bit serious, he had the kind of face that could easily break into a smile. I love that the life portraits of Hamilton show these smile lines. Sullivan says he had a light complexion with rosy cheeks and an uncommonly handsome face. It's a good friend. Alexander's grandson, Alan Hamilton, noted that his blue eyes were deep set above a strong Roman nose and that he had good bone structure with a strong chin and jaw. He also had reddish brown hair that he often wore powdered. In my depiction, I'm showing his natural hair color without powder, just to give an impression of the real man. In terms of paintings, the works by John Trumbull are the ones that most of us probably recognize. He painted at least 17, but all of these were painted from just two portrait studies that he made from life. Portraiture from the 1700s kind of turns into this game of telephone. The original likeness existed out there somewhere, but it was copied over and over, and each copy lost something of the original. This Trumbull portrait is probably one of the most famous, but the head was actually painted from a portrait bust made by John Jay, and then the body was completely invented. You can see how this doesn't give much in the way of accuracy. Trumbull also painted this version, which Hamilton's biographer, Gertrude Atherton, referred to as the fat boy Trumbull. She said, had Hamilton looked like it, he would have accomplished nothing. Ouch, Gertrude. Everyone in Hamilton's life seemed to have a different opinion about which portrait was the most accurate. Hamilton's grandson said the best likenesses were those by James Sharples. But then Alexander's wife, Eliza, said this portrait was perfect. And then Hamilton himself said the best likeness came from this profile portrait. Since it's difficult for me to recreate from a profile view, the image I've decided to work from is a bust. This 1796 bust by Giuseppe Caracci was made when Hamilton was 37 years old and was made from life, which is really important. It's generally a highly regarded likeness of the real man. 
One caveat is that Karachi did work in the Roman tradition, so this potentially leans towards being a little stylized, but it's also easy to see how well this image matches with other portraits of the Founding Father. So, let's take a look at the face of Alexander Hamilton, now. Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you for the next video.